Welcome back. In this fourth and final video, we'll contemplate what the scriptures have to say about life in the Eucharist after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's look back at what we covered in the last video. We explored the miracles of food from heaven, which were all associated with Passover. Passover being his uh, primordial work of redemption for the Hebrew people that then anticipated the work of redemption undertaken by Jesus Christ. Jesus then offers his body as a Passover sacrifice, as a ransom for the redemption of humanity. We, in turn, consume his body and blood to complete the sacrifice, just as the Hebrew people did, consumed the lamb that was sacrificed to complete their Passover sacrifice. His body and blood is miraculous food from heaven given to us under the appearance of bread and wine. Even though our senses cannot discern it, we know it by faith in Christ's promise. And for a first sampling of that life of faith after the resurrection, we turn to the Gospel of Luke. So in the Gospel of Luke, there's a very famous passage in which two of Jesus' followers become acquainted with the risen Jesus. And so this is uh, known as the uh, road to Emmaus. And we're going to go ahead and uh, look at it in some detail here. So this is Luke uh, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation which you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since this happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. And they came back saying they had even seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He appeared to be going further, but they constrained him, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished out of their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven gathered together and those who were with them, who said, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them, in the breaking of the bread. There's a lot going on in this passage, but I want to make reference uh, briefly to the breaking of the bread. In chapter 22, verse 19, we have Luke's institution narrative. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So when you bear that line in mind, what you see is that initially Jesus' appearance is concealed from them. They don't know that it's Jesus to whom they are speaking. But as he breaks the bread, they become aware of his presence. So too, for, for us Catholic Christians here and now, almost 2,000 years later, 
likewise come to know Jesus when the bread is broken. In Luke 24, verse 30, again, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Note, this is the same activity you see back in chapter 22, verse 19. So in 22, 19, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, blesses, give thanks, he broke it and gave it to them. These two things are the same event. The culmination of the road to Emmaus and the institution narrative are the same event. The road to Emmaus, in turn, you can think of as the first mass. Why? What happens? They, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So at Mass, what do we listen for first? We listen to a reading from the Old Testament in which we then see fulfillment in the gospel reading for that given day. And so we follow in our own liturgy the pattern given here in the road to Emmaus. This is the first Mass, the road to Emmaus. And every time we attend Mass, we are having the same experience as the travelers to Emmaus. Jesus makes himself present in our midst. That's not the only liturgical context in which we encounter Jesus. Let's go back to the book of Exodus. Um, so here we're going to look at, go back to chapter 16, and we're going to go ahead a bit to verses uh, 31 to 34 here in chapter 16. Now the house of Israel called its name manna. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. And Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations, that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the covenant to be kept. Note that we do the same thing with the Eucharist. We reserve it in the tabernacle placed above the altar in the sanctuary of our church. And we reserve it in the tabernacle in our perpetual adoration chapel where we Take one host in particular for adoration. So in the perpetual adoration chapel, we have an additional opportunity to be in the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist under the appearance of bread, but his true presence nevertheless. When we are in that perpetual adoration chapel, Jesus is as present to us as if we were on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. His presence is hidden, yes, but nevertheless, absolutely positively there. This chapel is a tremendous gift of our parish, and we all owe a debt of thanks to the volunteers who make it possible. And I would certainly encourage any of you uh, listening to watching this video to consider uh, signing up for a perpetual adoration hour in, in our parish. Uh, my own uh, perpetual adoration hour, which uh, is... 2 to 3 a.m. on Sunday mornings has borne me innumerable blessings, and I would wish the same blessings for everyone in the parish. Um, so make the time, you know, to book an adoration hour. Part of why I use a uh, dead of night hour is that nothing can be scheduled on top of it. I've always got that time free. And the sacrifice of losing... Um, couple of hours of sleep is nothing compared to the blessings I have gained by dedicating that time to being in the presence of Jesus. But what about reception of the Eucharist? So ultimately, <clears throat> that's what the Eucharist is intended for, is for us to receive it so that we may eat of it and be worthy of eternal life, partake in the fruits of the redemption of Jesus. Well, we need 
to be careful about this, actually. And this is something that St. Paul talks about in chapter 11 of his first letter to the Corinthians. So let's look at that. So chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, beginning at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also the chalice after supper, saying, This chalice is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the chalice, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. So in Paul's time, there were those among the church at Corinth who were taking the body and blood of Christ unworthily. And as a sign for believers, they suffered ill effects from doing so. Illness, even death. This isn't um, the common experience of us here and now, but nevertheless, St. Paul's caution is profound and to be meditated upon carefully. We can be too casual in partaking of the Eucharist, whereas, as Paul points out, prior to taking the Eucharist, we're called upon to examine our consciences. And if we have any serious sins on our consciousness, on our conscience, we need to confess them before taking the Eucharist. Some have the practice of confessing before any reception of the Eucharist. And indeed, for a long time, that was the common practice in the church. It's not automatically a bad practice, but since the time of Pope St. Pius X, we've been encouraged to receive the Eucharist regularly, even daily. And so it's important to remember that the church teaches that Taking the Eucharist actually forgives venial sins. However, if we're conscious of any serious sins or mortal sins, those we do indeed need to confess before coming to the Eucharist. Now, sometimes we might be in a situation where it's we're in a situation where it's uh, difficult, perhaps, to find a way out of a situation in which we are sinning repeatedly. And so the church calls us to still attend mass and participate in the community as full members of the community, but to step back from partaking of the Eucharist until we reach a moment or a time where we're able to make a good confession and correct our lives so that we may be worthy of receiving the Eucharist. And in this way, follow the caution given to us by St. Paul himself. So to summarize um, this video series, the Hebrews, won redemption from Pharaoh by means of the Passover lamb. Jesus wins our redemption from the devil by offering his life as a ransom on the cross. He is the lamb of God. Both the Passover lamb and the lamb of God must be eaten to complete the sacrifice and thus win the fruits of redemption. We eat the lamb of God under the appearance of bread and wine in the Eucharist. The bread of life, the body and blood of Jesus under the appearance of bread and wine, is miraculous food from heaven given to God for our spiritual benefit. As with the manna from heaven, we reserve it. And here at St. Joseph, we reserve it so that we may be in the presence of Jesus in the Adoration Chapel. We consume it in the liturgical celebration of the Mass, and we are called to carefully discern our worthiness to receive. And if we discern that we need to make a confession prior to receiving, we undertake to do so. So I hope that you have found this series of videos 
uh, interesting, enjoyable, and enlightening in pondering the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist and how we know of this presence of Jesus from the Bible. Uh, I hope, look forward to uh, seeing uh, many of you around the parish. If anybody wants to chat about the ideas that I recorded in this video, I'm happy to do so. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.